Good evening. Later in the programme, more spectacles from the Wanaka Air Show. But first, Dunedin City Council coming under pressure in the aftermath of Saturday night's student riot in North Dunedin. Residents are calling for a clean-up of substandard student flats. They want zoning changes in the area to get rid of high-density, cheap housing. And some people are pushing for tighter policing too. Michael Lynch reports. The repercussions will be flying for some time after Saturday's riots in North Dunedin. The finger's been pointed at both the university and the city council for not straightening out the cheap housing in the north of the city, right in the heart of the riot area. It's the usual wimpy sort of standoff, let's not do anything, um, we don't want to cause any problem, let's try and shovel it all under the mat again. This time it's got on the national news, there's no looking back now, they've blown it. The sort of things that go on at Otago in the student ghetto are appalling. I mean, there's substandard housing, stand, substandard works, just because people will come down here, can live for a year in very much, sub, in six months in substandard, in substandard mm. accommodation, and won't complain because they can get cheap rents because they don't have any money. The phrase has been used, student ghetto. Is it a student ghetto down there? No, but it has the potential to become one, and I think that's why we're, we're looking at the minimum standards for the housing. This will put the, put the rents up for those houses, though. It may do, but they, some of them are paying fairly high rents for uh, substandard accommodation. We've had letters about that going back as, since I became mayor. So the implication of that then is that landlords are profiteering out of this? I'm not involved in that side at all. All, all the council's interested in is looking at the, at the standards. Do you and we'll think, talk to the you Student think Association about that. Do you think landlords are profiteering? I have no idea. Well, if the accommodation is substandard, they're being charged high rents. Surely there's a certain injustice somewhere. Well, I have no idea what the rents are. I don't own student flats, and uh, I, I only know a few people that do, and the council's got no information on rents. There are some substandard houses in the area, uh, and generally it would have to be said that if we have trouble, it would be at those flats. The decent flats, the decent properties have been either uh, rebuilt or upgraded. We, we seldom have trouble in them. Why can't we do something about this? Are there profiteering landlords out there? I'd rather not comment on that. Uh, I would lead with the chin if, if I answered that one, but... All I can say is the university owns a lot of properties in the area and uh, most of them are in good condition and we seldom have trouble with those properties. We interviewed Lee Vandervis and Anton Angelo together right at the height of Saturday's troubles. They didn't quite see eye to eye. Well, great does, does someone have to die first before they, the Universal Council are going to do anything about the hellhole that they're turning North Dunedin into? Does someone it, have to is die, die hellhole first? Hell 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 I, I deny that it's the fault of the University Council. I think that too many people have been neglecting the whole situation for far too long. So who should worry about it if not the University Council? Well, the thing is you the want the landlords in the need north to raise their standards because the University you, Council bring too many people down no, here? No, I can't say they should raise the standards. I see they should enforce them on the landlords that are ripping off students left, right and centre. Mayor Richard Walls is calling for a report on the housing issue over the next few days. Waitaki Council officials today decided to step up their surveillance of local water supplies since confirmation the Kakanui River is contaminated with protozoa jardia. The Kakanui River also supplies six other communities now at risk of getting diarrhoea from the bug. Their water is also being tested. Meanwhile, the Kakanui's 4,000 gallon reservoir has been drained and cleaned out and super chlorinated water has been supplied to the town. But with the chlorine at about the same strength as a swimming pool, residents don't find it very palatable. They're still being warned to boil their drinking water and clean out their own supply tanks. The youth training vessel Spirit of Adventure is sporting a new addition thanks to the people of Stewart Island. It's an aluminium dinghy to help the trainees get to and from the mothership. The new vessel is a stabie craft made in Invercargill and is popular among fishermen for whizzing in and out of coves and beaches. The dinghy, named Spirit of Stewart Island, was bought from the donations of the Island's Lions Club. The islanders will get their first official look at it when it visits Stewart Island on the homeward leg of this voyage. The finishing touches are being put to the South Island's newest and tallest building. It's the new Price Waterhouse building in Christchurch, and the first tenants are set to move in. Cliff Joyner has been taking a look. Construction began on the Price Waterhouse building in April 1988, and already it's had its fair share of problems. The building was hit by striking construction workers, the collapse of the developer Wilkins and Davies, and the following dispute with subcontractors. But despite the problems, the tower has become one of the most dominant features of the Christchurch skyscape. Apart from its size and height, the Price Waterhouse building has some special features. The swimming pool, the sauna, the three-level car parking, and if that's not enough, there's the view. 
It's one of the few buildings in Christchurch with a clear view to the sea, and neither the price, $230 per square metre to lease, or its chequered history have seemed to have deterred businesses keen to move to this new site. We're having quite successful negotiations with tenants and uh, we look forward to being able to get a reasonably well-tenanted building by the time we're opening. The finishing touches are now being put on and it's hoped the first tenant will move here in July. 26,000 people entered a time warp at Wanaka during the weekend. For days, the air roared with the sound of warbirds or military airplanes and Kim Haring joined those who just wanted to be immersed in the atmosphere. There must be something in it for this number of people to be drawn here. The traffic streamed in by air and road as Wilson Neal's private jet, the Falcon 10, passed overhead. The crowd soon developed the dance that's peculiar to air shows and leads to sore necks and blind eyes. But the lineup of birds of war was so impressive that any self-respecting plane freak couldn't not be here. Spitfire, Mustang, Sea Fury and Trojan leading the squadron. But the non-military planes also put on a dazzling display. This pit special is piloted by Royal Air Force Club champion flyer Richard Hood. The manoeuvre you're about to see should not be attempted with a hangover. In fact, it's nicknamed the headache. The RNZAF put on its own special display showing that 25 years on, the Iroquois is still its workhorse. And although it too is dated, the Skyhawk never fails to wow the crowd. At the other end of history was the Fokker triplane, a World War I German fighter known as the Flying Venetian Blind. This is a replica of the plane flown by Baron van Richthofen in many a dogfight. Jumping a war or two, the Hawker Sea Fury, the last of the propeller-driven warbirds. And the Harvard flying team, the Roaring Forties, they left graceful images in the sky. But the crowd stood in attendance for the Spitfire, the plane that's been called the world's greatest fighter aircraft, and many just came to hear the sound of its Packard Merlin engine. This one flew ground attacks late in World War II over V-2 rocket sites in Holland. It's nearly 50 years old, but almost original in restoration. Unlike the Spitfire, this P-51 Mustang is not an original aircraft, but has been assembled from pieces of many Mustangs. When the Venom joined it in the air, the two put on an 800 km an hour chase that only two pilots with immense trust in each other could have performed. And the day ended with the traditional battle of the Luggett airstrip. Land-based vehicles had supposedly taken over the strip and the aircraft was scrambled to save the day. Needless to say, the good guys in the air won the show. It's amazing and great weather for the whole of Otago and Southland for the Easter break too. We'll be back tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>